One month later, Bill Deacon, who had previously thought he would be sent to Mihailovich, found himself on the opposite side of the mountains. Early one May morning, I found myself coming through these trees under escort, and much to my surprise, uh, I fell on a tent encampment. There were girls running around bringing soup and food in ski clothes. It might have been uh, a skiing vacation. But beyond them were, was a group of officers in uniform sitting in a circle on sawn tree trunks. They got up as I arrived, and one stepped out of the middle very quietly with a natural sense of authority. It was clear that he was the commander, and this was the man I'd come to try to identify. He said, what was the reason the British hadn't come before? Was it because the British thought that the partisans had killed Atherton? I said to him, this is not the case. We knew exactly the story, and we could pursue the matter further, but there was no point. There was no time, either. Hitler had ordered Operation Black, the liquidation of all resistance. The Germans feared Mihailovich more than Tito because of his links with the Allies. But they had now encircled 20,000 partisans in the mountains between Croatia and Montenegro. The ring was composed of 100,000 German, Italian and satellite troops. It was meant to be the last operation to liquidate the partisan movement in the most savage and brutal countryside, cut by deep ravines and gorges, the highest mountains in the country rising to, in some cases, 10,000 feet. So the battle was to break across this ring under savage German attack from the air and we had to face these natural obstacles which dictated the course of the battle. There were two words, the first two Yugoslav words I learned. The first was move, and the second was rest. It was during the pause you saw people. Uh, and the pause was never for more than 10 minutes. And all you could see was a huddled set of forms trying to get a, just a wisp of sleep or rest. And then you would hear the word, the order command given, move. Obviously, the most tragic images and the most tragic side of these movements of these people were the wounded. And it was an old Montenegrin Slav tradition that it was a great dishonor to leave your wounded behind. And this hampered your mobility. And this was deeply important psychologically because the morale of your army depended on the protection of your wounded. And, of course, we were confronted uh, with typhus cases from time to time. And I shall never forget this, not only the emaciation of their faces, but the absolutely distant look, as if they were no longer in this world at all. And quite often they would jump over a cliff or commit suicide, or jump into a, a stream or, or, or a gorge. One began bit by bit to put together some conception of who these people were and why they were there. There were women, student nurses, students in the universities, there were intellectuals, there were poets, there were painters, people whose villages had been burnt and just had to find somewhere to go. It was a new society, and it's really what they were fighting for, was the revolutionary Yugoslavia and the end of the old regime. After crossing the river Sutieska, 
the partisan columns moved up the slopes of Mount Osrin in an attempt to break through the German ring to the north. We climbed up to this place just before dawn. And within half an hour of our arrival, we were subject to a, a sudden air attack by the Germans. A motley circus of flying machines, Dorniers, Henschels, Stukas, even small civ civilian planes, uh, which dropped hand grenades on us from about 50 feet, started playing a sinister game of noughts and crosses. They flew this way and then that way, uh, trying to pin us down to liquidate the central group of the movement. As one plane came over, directly in our path, we saw a stick of bombs falling, and the last bomb, probably about 10 feet from where I'm standing. Instinctively, uh, Tito and I and two officers flung ourselves uh, into this hollow here. Tito's dog fell on top of him. The bomb exploded. Tito was wounded in the shoulder. I was wounded in the foot. One officer was killed, a Yugoslav officer. We then scattered and for the rest of the day found the best cover we could until dusk when the firing stopped and the planes flew away. It was quite clear that Osrin was a death trap. The night after the disaster on Osrin, it was decided rather hastily that we should move through a gap which had been blown in the German lines and in front of us. The horses carried Tito's radio station and their loss would have been irreparable. We marched in a single column in total silence. The Germans were about 500 yards on one side and about a mile on the other. They never moved at night. They didn't like night fighting in irregular warfare at all. But they were listening. We left behind us two companies of troops with orders that if the Germans moved and tried to attack our column, they would go into action and they were to be sacrificed. 20 minutes after we'd passed through the ring, the Germans closed it, thereby cutting off the division with the wounded. Most of the troops were annihilated, and all of the 3,000 wounded were massacred. At the beginning of August, after about 20 days of nights of marching, we arrived at a peaceful plateau above a small stream where we stopped for about three weeks. And this was the first opportunity of talking really with Tito and his staff, and in particular with Velibit, who was our liaison officer. I tried to uh, explain to Deacon the exact situation of uh, the Pazan forces in Yugoslavia, and also uh, one of my most important uh, tasks was, as I conceived it, uh, to um, convince him that the Chetniks, the Mihailovic people, not only that they did not fight the enemy, but they actually collaborated with him in many various and different ways. As this amateur German film shows, some Chetnik commanders were collaborating with the Germans as well as the Italians. What has always remained controversial is whether they were acting on their own initiative or under the direct orders of Mihailovic. Velibit presented Deacon with captured documents which implied that Mihailovic was personally involved and that the whole Chetnik movement was compromised. <laughs> 